Number five on this list is Villa Paula. This haunted place is located in Miami and has quite the interesting guest in the backyard. Thrillist says, this stately white mansion was originally constructed as the Cuban consulate in the mid 1920s, home to Consul Domingo Millard and his wife, Paula. The Cuban born Paula was known to spend her days playing piano and drinking Cuban coffee until she died from complications from a leg amputation in 1932. Legend has it that Domingo interred his late wife in a sarcophagus laid in the backyard. The sarcophagus is still there now, covered by ficus tree roots and nearly impossible to reach. Whether or not it actually contains her mortal remains is debatable at best, but reports of her ghost persist. It's said her ghost is in different rooms there, says History Miami's Dr. Paul George. People who've lived at Villa Paula since have had existential kinds of experiences. Among them, phantom coffee smells and piano playing, a one-legged woman roaming about as well. So there is a literal sarcophagus just chilling in this person's backyard. Can you imagine having that just show up on the house listing, I'd be like, um, no, we are not okay with that. I'm kind of surprised that no one has gone to go deal with the sarcophagus before. I mean, you can't just leave this thing down there like that and expect the ghost to just go away. I would imagine that Paula's spirit is probably tied to the sarcophagus and in turn it's tied to the area. Granted, I do kind of understand why no one wants to dig it up. Think about all the crazy stuff that's happened with the pyramids. You dig up this sarcophagus and you might end up being cursed for life, which is obviously something that nobody wants. But now we're left in this awkward place where we can't get rid of the ghost, but at the same time can't live here either. That's why I'm recommending to all of you watching, just avoid Villa Paula altogether. Number four on this list is the Blue Anchor Pub. So this is an interesting one because this pub didn't actually start in Florida. Thrillist says this pub was built in 1840s London during Jack the Ripper time, so it should be no surprise that it's haunted. The story goes that the bar was raised in London, but it's wooden interiors were sent to New York City and then onto this sleepy So Florida town in 1996. Little did anyone know that the pub's original elements came with the ghost of Bertha Starkley, a cheating wife who was murdered by her husband. Today she can be heard rattling pots, knocking things over, and wailing in the middle of the night at the Blue Anchor. Every night around 10 p.m., the time that she was murdered, Bertha likes to remind everyone she's still here so the current owners ring the ship's bell to scare her away. So first thing, I've never actually heard of that before where they take a building from one continent and then just decide to move it over to another continent. This bar must look pretty cool on the inside to go to all that trouble though. Obviously this was a bit of a mistake and everyone would have been better served if we relocated this thing straight to the dump. Bertha doesn't care if it's in London or America or anywhere. As long as the structure of this pub is still intact, her ghost will still be floating around, which makes it very hard to enjoy a night out at this place. Like imagine drowning several pints, going to take a piss, and then getting ambushed by some 1800s ghost in the bathroom with your pee pee hanging out. Like, I don't know if I'd ever be able to recover from that, folks. Number three on this list is St. Augustine's Lighthouse. Ah, yes, the haunted lighthouse. A true classic. Thrillist says St. Augustine's iconic lighthouse is a Florida landmark built in 1874 but climb up its 219 steps, and it's not just the views that will take your breath away. First, there's the ghost of Joseph Andrew, the original lighthouse keeper who fell to his death while painting the 165 foot tower. Then there are the Pity's two daughters who were playing with a building cart when it broke loose and slid into the nearby bay, drowning them both. While the girls giggle and run up and down the lighthouse steps, Joseph has been reported smoking cigars at the top of the lighthouse, keeping watch over his forever home. You know guys, if I had to be a ghost, then 
Being Joseph wouldn't be the worst. I get to look out at the pretty scenery at the top of my lighthouse where hardly anyone bothers me and I get to smoke cigars all day. Like, obviously I wouldn't want to be a ghost, but if I had to be, then this wouldn't be that bad. Either way, I'm not a ghost now. I am very much a human being, and if I want to stay a human being, then I recommend avoiding this place. It can obviously be very jarring to see two little ghost girls running around, and even though all of these ghosts are supposed to be pretty chill, we know that the paranormal can be unpredictable. I'm sure that there are tons of other non-haunted Florida lighthouses around if you're really pining for a good view. Number two on this list is Fort East Martello. If you don't like dolls, then you really won't like this one, guys. Thrillist says, if there is one rule all Floridians follow, it's do not mess with Robert the doll. The four-foot figurine has terrorized anyone who hasn't taken him seriously since he was gifted to artist Robert Jean Otto in 1904. Otto blamed any mischievous act around him on Robert the doll, effectively coining the oft-repeated Robert did it mantra. The doll currently holds court inside Fort East Martello, where he lives inside a glass case surrounded by a constant soundtrack of haunting xylophone music. The room evokes a heavy air immediately upon entering, and the walls are papered with apology notes from cocky tourists who've dared cross the world's most haunted place. Thing. Even the Prince of Darkness himself, Ozzy Osbourne, felt Robert's wrath when he suffered a series of health mishaps shortly after dissing the doll on his reality show. I don't like dolls, folks, especially the haunted variety, so this entry obviously had to make the list. Clearly, it curses you after you see it because people literally have to come back here and ask for its forgiveness. I don't know if the notes work or not, but I guess that's all you can do when you're dealing with a haunted doll. Hopefully this doll can just chill out and stop haunting people, but in the meantime, I just flat out avoid going to this place in Florida altogether. And number one on this list is Casa Monica Resort and Spa. It really sucks that this place is so haunted because it's truly beautiful. Thrillist says St. Augustine's fanciest hotel is also its most haunted. In fact, this five-star Mediterranean revival haunt is a hotbed of spectral activity. Children are heard running along along the fourth floor, but no one is there. The radio in the Ponche de Leon suite randomly comes on, but no one's there. Guests of room 411 wake up to people staring at them, but no one's there. But it's the three-story Flagler suite high in the tower that's most haunted. Maids have seen a child's handprint appear on the first floor bathroom mirror, and after knocking, one heard a man say, we've been expecting you from an empty bedroom. Its spookiest claim to fame, however, is the male ghost staring out of the top tower window. He's believed to be the ghost of one of two people, either Franklin Smith, the architect who built the hotel, or Henry Flagler, the man who purchased it. I personally don't care if it's the architect, the man who purchased it, or God. Anyone who says, I've been waiting for you as I enter an empty bedroom, it's not the type of individual I want to be around. Also, where are these children coming from and what are those sounds? Okay, so you want to tell me a scary story where the architect of the building fell in love with his work and then when he died, his ghost stayed here. All right, fine, I can buy that, I can believe that, but like, what are the children doing here? What do they have to do with this place and the architect? Maybe this is just one of those spots where it doesn't matter what happened here, it doesn't matter what will happen here in the future, it's just always destined to be haunted. Number five on this list is the Thunderbird Youth Academy. The Thunderbird Youth Academy is located in Pryor and is deeply haunted with the ghosts of students who have long passed. Back in 1942, it suffered a horrible tragedy where a lot of the children staying here passed away. Back then it was an orphanage and it was still years before it would become a military school. It got hit hard with a devastating tornado that the building simply wasn't ready for. Tons of the children who lived there perished due to the storm and now their ghosts are said to linger here. Stories where people will wake up in their beds and find literally other children lying in them staring directly at them are far too common. 
These stories also don't even factor in one of the most famous ghosts there, Hector. Hector is a young boy who haunts the third platoon building. Hector's story is far more graphic than the other children who died. It's not confirmed, but some say that the cook took Hector's life and did it in a fashion that I can't go into detail on YouTube about. Either way, now his spirit forever haunts this building and all of those who reside in it. I personally would never want to go to military school anyways as a kid, but having it be haunted would make it even worse. Number 4 on this list is the Tulsa Theater. It's weird how some places attract ghosts and spirits more than others. Theaters are one of the most prominent spots for paranormal presences, and this theater is no exception. News Oklahoma says, Tulsa Theater, formerly known as Brady Theater, used to be a vaudeville house providing entertainment to audiences. This space went through a lot over the years, including being abandoned and almost destroyed. But after renovations and a name change, the Tulsa Theater reopened. Legend is, the space is haunted by an Italian opera singer named Enrico Caruso. Caruso took in the sights around town while in Tulsa to perform. He wanted to see the oil wells and how they made them, said French. And as they came back, it was raining, it was cold, miserable, and the car broke down. Despite already being sick, Caruso made the journey back on foot in the rain to give what turned out to be his last performance ever. He had a great performance, according to history, French said. It was one of his best, standing ovations in the whole nine yards. Unfortunately, after returning to Italy, Caruso died. French said many say Tulsa caused Caruso's demise and that's why it's believed he haunts the theater. Even Caruso's manager named Tulsa as the reason for his death. But it goes deeper than just Caruso. When it was the Brady Theater, the building is rumored to have played a role in the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. I mean, it played a huge role. It housed some of the victims. There are rumors they died inside and some other horrible things that happened to them, French said. We actually captured electronic video phenomena evidence that almost confirms all of the stories there. The Tulsa Race Massacre was a horrible display of hate and racism. On May 31st in 1921, a bunch of white residents who had been given weapons by city officials attacked a bunch of black residents. This incident lasted over 24 hours and saw more than 800 people get injured and at least 36 people die. A horrifying tragedy that never should have occurred. It's no wonder that any place tied to this incident could be haunted. Number 3 on this list is the Hex House. Yeah, that's right guys, this place is literally called the Hex House, so it's no wonder why it's making the list. News Oklahoma says again, so this is something we feature in our serial killer tour. The new Hex House is inspired by the home that used to belong to Carol Ann Smith. French said the original Hex House, located at 10 East 21st Street, has negative energy attached. I mean, the things that she did with her nephew. They were dumping hot water on people that lived in the duplex next to them. There's also that whole history of her keeping those two hostages in the basement and kind of hypnotizing them, putting hexes on them. Yes, it's insane, said French. Claims of windshield wipers or stereos going on while the car is off are frequent if parked nearby. French even says they tested the theory during a tour and claimed she never did it again. We turned the bus off, but then it wouldn't start back up. It wasn't until a lady said she called Carol Ann a bad name and then she apologized. As soon as she was done, the bus came immediately back on, French says. The reason this house is on the killer tour list is due to what went down in 1928, guys. John Blymere, after receiving consultation from a woman named Nellie Knoll, thought that he had been cursed by another man named Nelson Raymer. John and some of his friends broke into the home, which is the Hex House, and then brutally killed Nelson. After they did this, they tried to set the house on fire, but it actually didn't burn. Since then, it's been a hotspot for ghosts, specifically that of Nelson Raymer. Number two on this list is the Stone Lion in Bed and Breakfast. This is definitely not the Airbnb you want to be booking for you and your pals for that relaxing weekend getaway you've been picturing. Travel Oklahoma says, stay at the Stone Lion in Bed and Breakfast in Guthrie at your own risk as a mischievous ghost child has been seen and felt throughout the home. The spirit, said to be that of 8 year old Irene Hewton, has been known to squeeze the toes of sleeping guests or even crawl into bed with them. The eerie tap 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 of a child's footsteps has also been heard leading from the second floor to the third. 
According to legend, the 8,000 square foot home was where the child met her fate when a nurse her with cough syrup containing them. The family later moved on, but little Irene refused to leave. After the Houghton family moved out, the home changed into a boarding house and then a funeral home. Paranormal investigative teams have encountered several other ghosts, including a strong male entity who lingers in the basement where the morgue once was. Through the years of people staying here, there have been tons of reports of sightings and interactions with ghostly entities. As mentioned, it's pretty normal to be visited by Irene, the ghost of the young girl who passed here. A bit of a rarer encounter is that of a ghostly music box, though. The owner Becky has come out and said, One of my guests just the other day came out of this room and said, All night long I heard this music box. Now it's unclear whether one of the ghosts was playing this music box, or if the box just sort of started on its own, but that would definitely be enough to keep me awake if I was that guest. Pictures, videos, and voice recordings have all been captured here by paranormal investigators many times. It was first investigated by a paranormal specialist 18 years ago, and since then it's been a hotspot for all ghost hunters alike to check out. Unless you're well versed in dealings with spirits, I'd pick a different Airbnb for you and your buddies. And number one on this list is Guthrie's Boys Home. This site started out as an orphanage in 1923 when it was built. Now becoming an orphan would truly be a horrible experience that I can't even begin to understand, but I can guarantee you that it would have been far worse if you got sent to this orphanage. That's because of the horrible atrocities committed here. There is no denying that the maid who worked here back then was sick. Mentally sick, deranged to a point where she felt a desire to harm these young orphans. It's believed that she would often abuse these innocent children in any number of ways. Now this isn't confirmed, but these are rumors. It's also thought that she even took the life of a few people while she was working here and made it look like an accident. This all culminated one day when she finally took her own life by jumping out of the bell tower and falling to her death. This has obviously led to some spiritual presences staying behind. Lucky for all of us, it's not the spirit of this sick old maid who died. However, as sad as it is, it's the spirits of some of these children here who were wronged. There is apparently one girl who appears to visitors and begs for safety. Crying and screaming children can be heard echoing throughout the building at all hours of the day. The sounds of little feet running up and down the halls are regularly reported as well. Believe it or not, this isn't enough to drive people away though because it's a popular wedding spot. Definitely not the area I would choose to get married if it was up to me though. Alright, I think I'm going to kick off today with a case from Detroit, Michigan. The mystery of the disappearance of Phyllis Ann Flynn is one that lingers, casting a shadow over the years that have passed since that fateful night in May of 1988. Which was before I was born. It's a puzzle that has defied resolution, leaving family and investigators grasping at straws in their quest for answers. After a birthday celebration at the Hotel Yorba in Detroit, Flynn vanished without a trace. The circumstances surrounding her disappearance are as mysterious as the the hotel itself. She had requested that her father pick her up, a plea that would echo throughout the years as a haunting reminder of the unanswered questions. Now the timeline of events is hauntingly sparse. A few days after her birthday, Flynn called home, signaling her desire to be retrieved from the Hotel Yorba. However, when her father arrived, she had evaporated into thin air, leaving behind an eerie void. And nobody has heard from her since. In the years that followed, the case went cold, a perplexing enigma with no breakthroughs. The detective assigned to Flynn's case retired, and the shadows seemed to close in on the scant leads. But even as the official investigation drew to a close, a glimmer of hope persisted among those determined to unravel the mystery. A family friend and a diligent Michigan State Police detective breathed some new life into the cold case back in 2014, so about a decade ago, reigniting the flame of inquiry. The Community United Effort Center for Missing Persons brought national attention to Flynn's disappearance, thrusting it into the spotlight of awareness building efforts. The passage of time has not dimmed the resolve of those seeking closure. The Missing in Michigan campaign, led by Detective Sarah Krebs, has tirelessly worked to unearth fresh clues. The story of Phyllis Flynn found its place on billboards, a visual plea for information that could hopefully pierce through the fog of uncertainty. But to this day, the question remains, what happened at the Hotel Yorba? The void left by Flynn's disappearance resonates, a silent call for answers. The reward offered by Crime Stoppers of Michigan stands as an incentive, a monetary beacon beckoning anybody with information to step forward. But with the passage of 36 years, the harsh reality is lingering. Flynn's family, against the odds, clings to hope that she might still be alive. 
but sadly, the Hotel Yorba, once a backdrop to a birthday celebration, now stands as a silent witness to a disappearance that continues to baffle those who seek resolution. So I don't exactly have a name for this next hotel, outside of knowing that it's somewhere in the UK. I know, vague, but it was worth telling today. Imagine a place shrouded in whispers and veiled in the unknown. A hotel that, over the years, has become an unsettling enigma, a backdrop to a haunting mystery that eludes comprehension. It's not like your typical story. It's a tale woven with threads of uncertainty and shadowed by the inexplicable disappearances of 66 young people. Nestled in the heart of the countryside, this hotel, with its weathered facade, stands as a testament to a history stained by the unexplained. The corridors echo with the distant laugh of young people who once roamed freely, their footsteps now silenced by a force that transcends the boundaries of our understanding. The first whispers of the mystery dates way back, like decades. A quiet murmur amongst locals who traded stories of curious occurrences. As time unfolded, so did the tales of the vanished youths, leaving a chilling imprint on the history of this seemingly ordinary establishment. Each disappearance, if we're going to compare it to something, maybe a jigsaw piece missing from a larger puzzle, paints a spectral image of uncertainty. The missing people, diverse in their backgrounds, ages, and stories, all converge at this point, their common thread being a vanishing act that perplexes even the most seasoned investigators. The authorities, puzzled and haunted by the lack of clues, have combed through the hotel's history, interviewed witnesses, scrutinized every nook and cranny, but they've got nothing. The answers remain elusive, like ghosts slipping through the fingers of those who seek them. The hotel itself, with its creaking floorboards and flickering lights, becomes a stage where the mundane collides with the mysterious. An invisible hand seems to orchestrate a malevolent symphony, leaving behind a disconcerting silence in the wake of each disappearance. The local community, once welcoming, now gazes upon the hotel with a mix of fear and curiosity. Whispers in the wind suggest that the place holds secrets, that it harbors an otherworldly energy, indifferent to the laws of our reality. As the count of those who have vanished climbed, the hotel's reputation transformed. It became more than bricks and mortar. It was just this living, breathing entity with a story. The rooms, once filled with the innocent laughter of youth, now resonate with an eerie stillness, a reminder of those who stepped into the shadows and never returned. Yeah, that's not somewhere I want to visit. No thank you, I'll leave the mysteries there. I don't need to unravel them. Now next up, we have a legend that I believe to be true. Many, many, many years ago, an English woman and her daughter, at the conclusion of a tour in the Near East, arrived at a Paris hotel at the time of the exhibition. They were given separate rooms, one above the other. Trust me, I wouldn't want to be in the same room as my mother. After resting for a few hours, the daughter went to go see her mother, but the room was empty and completely altered. Like new wallpaper, new furniture, new everything. She was, she was panicking, she called the maid and then the manager, and the manager was like, you're under a delusion. When you arrived at this hotel, you were quite alone. But the girl was like, no, we signed our names in the visitor's book, mother and I. So they brought out the visitor's book and above the daughter's name, what the mother had signed, was a signature of a stranger. Now, it wasn't until about a year later that the daughter learned that her mother had died suddenly of the plague. And that in order to save Paris from, you know, crazy panic and the exhibition from absolute ruin, it was hurriedly agreed by the authorities that the death should be completely hushed up and that the daughter should be made to believe by the repeated denials of hotel servants, hotel managers, and cabmen, and the proofs of you know the changed room and the altered visitors book that her unfortunate mother never reached the hotel. Imagine, like you go to take a nap and you wake up and all of a sudden, okay, mom's gone and you're Delulu. The girl allegedly found out the truth in a letter from a chambermaid. So when the story was originally told at a dinner at the house of Arthur Benson, Arthur Balfour, you know at the time uh, British Prime Minister, they were all hanging out and Balfour was like. Yeah, I'm gonna guess the ending. Now, a journalist for the Pall Mall Gazette, I think this was around 1913, talked to the author who originally published the tale, a Mr. Clement K. Shorter, noting by this time, of course, you know, we've all heard the story. What's the truth to it? And Mr. Shorter's like, no, like, I believe it happened. It is a heck of a lot easier to believe that it happened than it was invented. And given an illness under precisely the same circumstances, the French police authorities are like the only police authorities in the world who are equal to coping with it so brilliantly. I just, I can't imagine waking up and being told Hey, you're completely wrong. No, thank you. Now for a tale that cursed me to my core, Liz, Sarah, and the Cosmos Resort. Two years ago, a seemingly ordinary vacation turned into a nightmarish odyssey for a pair of friends, Liz and Sarah. The backdrop? A hotel that, despite its outward appearance of renovation and cheerfulness, concealed a darkness that would shake the very core of their existence. So the girls went in the lobby, they're like, okay, we're gonna go sign in but there was this feeling of unease that was just sort of everywhere in the air. The check-in process was marked by odd glances and a peculiar conversation with the hotel staff. But they got upgraded. Woohoo! room 347. This room with a view that one Sarah over. Seemed like, okay, things are getting better. Maybe my gut's just off. Maybe I need a nap. <laughs> the 
The first night was uneventful for Sarah, but for Liz, the shadows whispered secrets that kept her awake. Strange scratching noises emanated from behind the walls, which, yikes, that's not a soundtrack I want when I'm trying to sleep. And it only got worse as the days went on. A hidden door, concealed behind a nightstand, revealed a narrow, ominous space that reeked of rust and bleach. Yeah, that's terrifying. As Sarah delved deeper into the mystery, she discovered a network of tunnels, a dark labyrinth that extended beneath the hotel. The eerie passageways, laden with a stench of decay, hinted at a sinister purpose, one that became much more apparent as time went on. Liz's disappearance on the final night of their stay plunged Sarah into a desperate search for answers. The hotel staff's nonchalant response and the dismissive attitude of the police created an air of conspiracy. Sure, because the hidden door that led to under the hotel with the sense of decay wasn't enough. Determined to unravel the enigma, Sarah returned to the haunted hotel, guided by an invitation that seemed to taunt her, if you will. The nights after became a harrowing exploration of the hotel's hidden layers. The aged sections, neglected and avoided, hinted at a malevolence that defied, well, my brain. The discovery of a bricked up elevator shaft and the disturbing encounters in the narrow tunnels hinted at a malevolent force that lurked within the hotel's very foundation. So, fast forward, it's the final night. And in a desperate attempt to retrace Liz's steps, Sarah was led to an encounter with entities that, well, weren't of this world. Liz, or a distorted version of her, beckoned from the shadows. The nightmarish entities, with eyes that pierce the darkness, pursued Sarah through the dilapidated corridors, transforming the once grand ballroom into a grotesque spectacle. Now this whole mess reached its climax on the mysterious seventh floor. The revelation that Liz's encounter in the tunnel had birthed something malevolent. Something that wore her face, but harbored unspeakable horrors. Yeah, it painted a bit of a grim picture. The hotel's twisted reality, where time and space lost coherence, left poor Sarah grappling with a profound sense of dread. Now, now, this sad story concludes with Sarah's escape, but the psychological scars, they run deep. The fear of encountering those otherworldly entities, of witnessing the distorted face of Liz, yeah, that's gonna linger like a memory you don't wanna have. The hotel, now a malevolent entity in its own right, kind of stands as a thin veil that separates our world from the other world and not one you want to go near. Time to travel over to the heart of Santa Fe, and no, that isn't a cue for Newsies and Rent fans, so hush. <laughs> Nestled within the walls of the La Posada Hotel lies a tale that, well, it's gonna give you some nightmares, folks. That's a narrative steeped in mystery, spectral apparitions, and unexplained phenomena. Cool, we got the whole trifecta. Room 256, once the abode of Julia Staub, echoes with the whispers of a bygone era, where the living and the dead seem to converge in a dance of the paranormal. Is it a ballet? So Chuck Barone, a vigilant security guard, recounted an eerie encounter that unfolded in this specific room of the hotel. In the company of a bellhop and a group of tourists, they approached said room, room 256, responding to a mysterious voice emanating from within. I'm in here, it beckoned, yet upon investigation, the room was empty, with its windows locked from the inside, so there was no getting out of there. There was a phantom presence. Unseen, but you felt it. The paranormal enigma extended way beyond Chuck's story, by the way. His son John, a fellow guardian of the hotel secrets, if you will, witnessed a ghostly face in the men's room mirror. It was a woman's face, staring back at him, sending a shiver right down his spine. And this inexplicable encounter left him pale and shaken, which, yeah, that tracks. Ross Weisenhoff, once a skeptic, found himself entangled in the spectral tapestry of the hotel as well. Awakening in the middle of the night, he noticed a luminescent figure at the foot of his bed. This entity morphed into the ethereal form of a woman, fixating on him with an otherworldly gaze. Now this encounter shattered his skepticism, prompting a swift, I'm getting out of here, as you do. The genesis of these ghostly manifestations lies in the tragic history of Julia, the lady of the mansion turned spectral hostess. She was once the vibrant center of Santa Fe's social tapestry, but fell into self imposed exile after the loss of her eighth spawn. The Grand Mansion, a testament to love and opulence, transformed into the La Posada Hotel in 1936. Enter Christopher Chacon, a seeker of truth from the Organization of Scientific Investigation and Research. Alongside a team of experts, he delved into the paranormal intricacies of the hotel. Physical, psychological, and electrical examinations were conducted, leaving no stone unturned. Twelve hours in isolation within the bedroom that's, you know, doing all the bad things, monitoring the environment for any spectral stirrings. Infrared technology and night vision equipment were brought in, but despite the diligence, the source of the haunting remained elusive. Which, okay, we'll let you be. Ghosty ladies can do what you want, I would like to live. I'll start off with an easy one, and that's Centralia, Pennsylvania. From the late 1800s to the 1960s, this place was a quaint but bustling town in little Pennsylvania, thanks to its very prosperous coal mines. 
However, when a mine mysteriously caught fire in 1962, the flames began to spread underground via the interconnecting tunnels. Although the citizens were aware of the situation, they weren't truly troubled until two isolated incidents a couple years later. A gas station owner reporting abnormally high gasoline temperatures in his underground tanks in 1979, and a young boy nearly falling into a 150 foot deep sinkhole over in his backyard in 1981. After that, the town's population plummeted. This town has burned for about 50 years now. This mine certainly seems like a fiery lair of dastardly demons and spirits. What's more is the fire heats the groundwater to boiling temperatures, causing a lot of steam to rise. On a lot of days, this gives Centralia's landscape an unsettling, misty appearance. With only a couple of buildings left, it's a abandoned place. A lot of the residents are not there. I think there's only four left. So if you go to Centralia, it's a ghost town. This place has actually more people buried there than it has living residents, which is super unsettling if you ask me. So if you're driving around the town, you'll find three cemeteries, St. Ignatius, St. Peter and Paul Orthodox, and Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you're gonna walk around the ruins of this modern day ghost town, it'll give you the feeling of supernatural forces working underfoot. And because of all this, there's been some stories that have come to light. Some are stories from visitors who left in fear after thinking they saw a person or a thing, heard odd sounds, and some folks just felt like they were being watched. Other people go so far as to say that this place is the gateway to hell. One group of visitors heard what sounded like a voice saying something inaudible from down below when they were visiting a cemetery. At first they were like, okay, maybe it's somebody else, and they're like, well, forget about it. Then they heard it again, a little more clearly, just a few words, and it sort of sounded like, leave this place. At that moment, the hill the group was standing on started steaming, more so than before, and it really stunk, like rotten eggs. It's spooked to the friends, so they made the decision to leave, and as they were heading back to their car, they heard it again. Not the same words and not clear, but something like, why? Why did you do that? What was even weirder is that it wasn't like somebody was yelling it out of the bushes. It was quiet, kind of closer, nobody knew where it was coming from. It seems like most colleges and universities have at least a couple of ghost stories to tell, and Wichita State University in Kansas is no exception. Tales of mysterious sounds, lights, and figures are commonplace in the older buildings on campus. Two buildings in particular come up when the campus ghost stories start getting told. Henry and Gymnasium and Wilner Auditorium are part of the WSU lore about things that go bump in the night. I love that song from Scooby-Doo. The story of the ghost in Henry and tells of a maintenance worker who was electrocuted on the very job in the 1950s. Details kind of vary. Some say he hit a live wire with his bare head. Another version says that he was hit by lightning while mopping. It said that his ghost appears in the building in the middle of the night and early in the morning. The auditorium, on the other hand, has gained a reputation for being very haunted. We've got all the usual suspects, flickering lights, doors closing on their own, disembodied voices, and the occasional apparition. A lot of folks have witnessed it. Mary Nelson, a program consultant for the library, says the ghost is likely that of George Wilner, the namesake of the building. She's like, eh, he's probably friendly, just wants to make sure his building is taken care of. Which, I get it. Now also apparently Fisk Hall might be haunted. Since it's the oldest building on campus, it certainly has the history to be a likely place for a haunting. It's been used as a men's dormitory, an infirmary during the influenza situation, and the office space for a lot of different departments. Even investigators from the Wichita Paranormal Research Society picked up the possible presence of a ghostie. We didn't get a name, sadly. I know cemeteries are kind of low hanging fruit when it comes to being haunted, but let me have this. The Bonaventure Cemetery in Savannah, Georgia is home to a couple of notable ghosties, and I just fell so in love with them today that they had to make my list. Located on the 17 mile long Wilmington River, some three miles down from downtown Savannah, is this fascinatingly beautiful cemetery that has been described as a natural cathedral. Like, come on. You've got these stoic, tall live oak trees that are just cloaked in Spanish moss. They're all lighting the winding paths. It's such a beautifully haunting allure to the many elaborate and time-stained monuments that are throughout this location. To offset the grays and the gloominess are these vibrant azaleas and plenty of other flowers that are just bursting with color when they bloom in the spring and summer. The 100 acres of this special place have stirred the emotions of generations of visitors over quite a few years, but apparently you're going to feel something stir in you the minute you approach the main gate and not because of a brand muffin or coffee. A novel that subsequently became a major motion picture that was published in 1994 owes a lot to the cemetery and vice versa. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is a first person account of life in the Old South, interwoven with a mystery that casts Savannah as its backdrop and features the statue of a girl holding two small bowls, one on each hand on the front cover. Legend has it that the statue is haunted by the ghost of Lorraine Greenman, the little one who posed for the artist. Little Wendy, as the statue is also referred to, once stood sentinel over the Trostel family plot, but she became so idolized as a result of her newfound fame, and it wasn't even central to the book's plot, that the owners donated the statue to Savannah's Museum of Art to just avoid 
destruction and for safety. Another famous sculpture that has elicited some crazy stories or legends depending on your point of view is that of Gracie Watson or as she is affectionately known, Little Gracie. This young one died of pneumonia and was memorialized in marble by artist John Waltz from nothing but a photograph. And for years, people have reported seeing a little one that fits her description playing around. The legend claims that she appears as a normal living one in a white dress who vanishes without a trace when you get too close. And to some, she still lives. Visitors leave toys for her to play with, especially around Christmas time. And if you move them or you take them away, she's gonna cry tears of human redness. So. Leave her toys alone. Let her play with them. What arm is it doing you? All right, let's see if I pronounce this properly. Calcasio Courthouse. I tried, folks, I really did. According to the local parish clerk of courts, the main part of the courthouse building was built in 1912. It is on the National Register of Historic Places, while an addition was tacked on in the mid 90s. A lot of folks believe that the courthouse is haunted and that the individual whose ghost is doing that haunting is a convicted killer by the name of Tony Joe Henry. She was the only woman to be executed in the electric chair in Louisiana history, unless somebody forgot to put a name down. And it just so happens that the flip of the switch that led to her death happened here. Allow me to give you some context on her. For start she didn't really have an easy start in life. Her mother died when she was young, prompting her father to remarry, and uh, whew. Tony was not a fan of the new living arrangement, wanted to go live with an aunt. Why? Well, her dad wasn't great. He hurt her, prompting her to just run away instead. She fell into a world of crime, substances, and intercourse work. She was working at a brothel when she met a man named Claude Cowboy Henry. According to the local gazette, Henry was a former boxer who, after leaving the ring, found himself living a life of crime. The two fell in love and the cowboy seems to have treated Tony well. She was in the clutches of substance addiction when they met, but upon marrying, they were like, let's move to California. Let's try and kick that. However, they decided to go back to Texas for a minute, and Cowboy was arrested for a killing that he had committed before the couple had married. And he received a 50 year sentence for his crime. Tony Joe was still madly in love and was like, hmm. Let's figure out how to get you out of jail. She found herself an accomplice for this plot, a man named Harold Burks, who went by Arky. Burks had served time in the same prison that the cowboy was incarcerated in. And Tony was like, let's use that knowledge. The first step, let's rob a bank. Because why not? Tony and Burks encountered a man named Joseph P. Calloway, who was delivering a car and was like, okay, I'll give you a ride. According to the local gazette, they were like, mm, we're gonna hijack this car and use it as a getaway vehicle. But sadly, they killed Calloway. After Tony's arrest, the heinous nature of her crimes, coupled with her good looks and the fact that the death penalty was on the table, her trial became a media sensation. She was found guilty, sentenced to death, which was upheld after several appeals. She was executed in the electric chair on November 28th of 1942. And nowadays, well, her ghost is just hanging around the courthouse. According to various sources, there have been reports of unexplainable screams, electrical mishaps, and the smell of cheap perfume. But there's another odor sometimes reported at the courthouse that is far more disturbing and fitting to the story and death of Tony Joe Henry, the unexplainable smell of burning hair. Alrighty folks, we're gonna end today with the Dock Street Theater in Charleston, South Carolina. This theater, which is not located on Dock Street, but on Church Street, is pretty neat. One quirky fact is that at one time it was actually a hotel. It is now technically the last surviving Hotel. Guests of the theater have claimed to see spirits roaming about. We've got sightings of ghostly apparitions in the rafters, apparitions on the stage, and a lot of folks are like, were they failed actors? Were they admirers of the theater? Was there something more tragic? Well, we know there's been a lot of sightings, but there's two particular spirits that have been seen more than any of the others. One of them is believed to be Junius Brutus Booth, the father of the infamous presidential assassin. No one's really sure why his ghost is haunting the theater, because aside from performing there with his theater troupe, and apparently he tried to kill the manager of the hotel, he doesn't have any other strong ties to the building. But the most frequently spotted ghost at this lovely theater is Nettie, who lived in Charleston during the 1800s and could usually be found at the Planters Hotel. She wasn't a guest or a member of the staff, she was a bit of a freelancer. What was her occupation? The world's oldest profession. Poor thing was killed by a bolt of lightning, leading to a sudden and unexpected death, leaving her with unfinished business that I guess nobody has been able to help her with yet. The ghost of Nettie can be seen gliding around aimlessly throughout the entire theater. The ghost of Nettie can be seen gliding around aimlessly throughout the theater. Some of those who have caught a glimpse of her claim that she was wearing a tattered yet vibrantly colored red dress. How fitting. Number five on this list is the Hay Adams Hotel. This hotel is located in Washington, D.C. and has quite the history to it. USA Today writes, quite possibly the most famous hotel in the capital, the Hay Adams has hosted many a politician, including the Obamas before inauguration. In 1884, best friends John Hay, Abraham Lincoln's private secretary and later a secretary of state, and Henry Adams, the author and descendant of John Quincy, built their homes on the plot of land where the hotel now sits. In 1927, nine years after 
after Adam's death, the houses were raised and replaced by the hotel that stands today. Adam's wife, Marion Hooper Adams, killed herself on the site in 1885 and her spirit reportedly haunts the hotel. Guests and staff say they can hear a woman crying softly, disembodied voices and doors opening and closing on their own. What is it about hotels and people taking their own lives? It feels like so many hotels are haunted because someone left the world far too early and usually it was their decision to do so. Marion Hooper Adams is no exception and she has made this hotel a very inhospitable place to stay. Sometimes you hear the faint cries of a creature or spirit and they go away, but apparently her spirit absolutely wails. All the time there are screams and crying heard. In fact, it's so repetitive that it gets less scary and more of an annoyance than anything else. People literally just can't sleep at night because they're constantly listening to her crying over how her life ended. It's also a nuisance when they find things missing all the time. Marion likes to move things and steal items. Oftentimes, the valuables of these people are gone if they leave the hotel for an extended period of time and then come back. Now, maybe this part of the legend is actually just one of the hotel workers stealing stuff and blaming it on her, but either way, things will go missing if you stay here. It's overall just a horrible experience being at this hotel for an extended period of time, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Number four on this list is Hotel Provincial. Located in New Orleans, this hotel is teeming with paranormal energy. USA Today says the two-story Hotel Provincial with 94 rooms in the historic French Quarter is a retreat into old New Orleans. Like many New Orleans properties, it also claims to be a popular paranormal activity hub. Like other area hotels, the property acted as a medical facility for wounded Confederate soldiers and is said to still possess their spirits. From distressed soldiers and operating doctors to pools of blood, guests have reported it all. If actually staying at the property seems too spooky, it's also a stop on many walking ghost tours of the city as well. Pools of blood, guys. Literal pools of blood. Just imagine walking into your hotel room after a long day of doing stuff, getting in your PJs, moving the comforter over to your bed to slip in, and then seeing a bunch of blood just ooze out. This has actually happened to people before. That would absolutely scar me for life if something like that ever went down. Not to mention people actually getting physically scarred when they come here. People have reported getting attacked by unknown paranormal entities while staying here. Waking up to a spirit completely ravaging them and having no idea how or why it's happening. This is not the type of hotel that you want to stay at and you will literally risk your safety if you do. Number three on this list is the Feister Hotel. This one has been around for a while and has got a lot of people scared who've stayed here. Travel and Leisure says the historic Feister Hotel opened in Milwaukee in 1893 with elegant interiors and advanced technology for the times, including electricity, individual thermostat controls, and fireproofing, making it one of the most sought after accommodations in the city. The hotel is supposedly home to a number of spooky sightings. In fact, several MLB players have reported their own personal ghost experiences in the hotel, and some are even too scared to stay there again. So guys, I actually run a podcast all about the MLB. Because I run this podcast, I'm pretty knowledgeable about the MLB. I have literally heard of this hotel before even doing research on this video. Players will flat out refuse to play here now because they get way too scared and can't get any sleep when they're there. Then obviously when they play their game the next day they suck because they just spent the entire night basically fending for their lives in this haunted hotel. It's really too bad that it has to be this way because this is apparently one of the nicer hotels in Milwaukee. It's definitely one of the oldest and back then it was the best place to stay if you wanted a luxurious night. Hopefully the goats that reside here eventually leave and we can all enjoy it once again without getting completely haunted. Number two on this list is the Emily Morgan Hotel. The Emily Morgan Hotel is located in Texas and is probably the most haunted in that entire state. It wasn't always the lovely and renovated hotel that it is today. Prior to this being a beautiful place to stay, this was actually a hospital and a place for doctors to stay. 
Obviously, during that period, it saw a lot of illness and death, and that has tainted the space. But believe it or not, though, this isn't the only set of tragedies that this location has seen. Before it was a hospital, before it was anything at all, on this very site where the hotel currently sits was the Battle of the Alamo. The Battle of the Alamo was one of the most critical battles in the Texas Revolution. The battle lasted for 13 brutal days in 1836. It was between the Mexican soldiers and the Texan soldiers. The Mexican soldiers won out and killed every single one of the Texan soldiers who were there defending their fort. This battle is one of the most famous in American history for how horrible and brutal it was. It's no wonder that the land here is haunted and will infect basically anything that's built here. It also doesn't help when the hotel used to be a hospital which saw its fair share of horrible things too. Nowadays, this hotel has a whole cast of paranormal characters. Soldiers from back in the day have been spotted roaming around the halls and patients and doctors as well. There have even been a few occasions where people have reported having visions of being on the battlefield as if they were transported there. Definitely not the spot to be staying on your vacated Texas. And finally, number one on this list is La Fonda on the Plaza. This is a hotel located in New Mexico that has been host to plenty of tragedies. Travel and Leisure says this beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico hotel has an incredibly rich history. Since 1609, a number of inns have been located on this very site, but a handful of events may be the cause of continued hauntings. According to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the ghosts of a judge shot in the lobby, a businessman who gambled everything away at the hotel before jumping down a well and a bride killed on her wedding night are just a few of the spirits that you may come across during your stay here. That's three spirits too many for me, guys. Whenever situations like this arise, I start to question things. What I mean is that isn't this a little bit odd that three totally separate, completely different tragic events all took place right here at different times? Sure, it could be a coincidence, but it seems like a rather sad one if you ask me. Maybe there was always something about this space that was just a little off. Maybe people who come here just get hit with horrible luck. Maybe this hotel was built on some sort of ancient ground that it shouldn't have been built on, and this is the horrible reaction. I obviously can't say for sure, but something's fishy about this hotel, and I wouldn't recommend checking it out if I was you. Number five, Hockamock Swamp. Already sounds pretty scary in itself. Something about swamps, you know what I mean? During the 17th century, the Hockamock Swamp was used as a fortress by the Wampanoag people, the predominant band of natives in the area, against invasion by the early British settlers. It played a landscape role in King Philip's War as a strategic base of which to launch assault with nearby English settlements. During the 18th and 19th centuries, settlers deemed the swamp to be useless, barren land, and it didn't really do much besides sit there and just kind of take up space. They attempted to drain it and convert it into a profitable farmland, however, nothing really grew. Hmm. The natives of the region placed a much higher value on the swamp, however, for centuries. The first people had relied on hunting food there, riddled with fauna, and the swamp had gained an important legend and folklore among them as being a place where many things meet. They named it Hakomak, the Algonquin term meaning place where spirits dwell. And that's exactly what people say they do dwell there. What makes this swamp so haunted is the different purposes it was used for. A cesspool for bones of the fallen. Some places are just more susceptible to violence and death over the years. And that reputation of spirits lingering is what's so heavy and cold about this location. Much of the swamp served a dual purpose as a sacred burial ground as well. The Hakomak is occasionally referred to as the home of the Hobomak. The Wampanoag people worshipped and feared Hobomak, the chief deity of death and disease. Hobomak, composed of human souls of the dead, was known to congregate in areas like the Hockamock Swamp, thus the term and lore stuck. Yep, just a giant mud monster swallowing souls. Charming. There are many stories and legends that have become associated with this swamp and are even connected to the number one on my list. It remains a place of mystery and fear and apparently good frog catching. Number four, Lowell Cemetery. Lowell Cemetery is a cemetery located in Lowell, Massachusetts. Founded in 1841 and located on the banks of the Concord River, the cemetery is one of the oldest garden cemeteries in the country, making it a perfect place for violence and an eternity of soul searching. Many of Lowell's wealthy industrialists are buried here under a lavish Victorian tomb Stones. Visitors have claimed that this is one of Massachusetts' most haunted cemeteries. What makes a haunted cemetery more haunted than another haunted cemetery, you know? Is there like a competition or like a quota or something? Just gotta keep the numbers up. 
What is it? I feel like every local claims their cemetery is the oldest and most haunted. And this brings me to our fair maiden here, the mysterious witch, Bonnie. A popular meeting place amongst the local teens at night for some scares and some screams, the statue of a woman with her arms outstretched on a rectangular tomb, her hands clutching a veil that falls down behind her body as though it were a cloak caught in the wind. Her eyes lay cold, staring at the heavens. Under her left eye, a black tear. Paranormal researchers have claimed that the statue holds more of an electromagnetic current and strange things can be seen in front and around the statue, making it seem like it's moving from time to time. Creepy. There is local lore that if you leave a coin or ribbon on the statue, then you'll get good luck, and in return, if you steal or take the items from the statue, the haunting whispers of bad karma will follow. Although research shows that this gravesite holds no actual sinister history, the ghostly sightings surrounding it are a hot spot within the cemetery. I bet at night under the moonlight this woman could be very terrifying. Number 3. Boston Common Most common fact about the common, one of the most haunted places in Boston. That rhymed really weird, didn't it? If you're out for a walk and feel the need to brush up on your American history, then you can be sure to either see the ladies by the trees or the Patriot men rushing the battlefront. Well, what's left behind from them at least. The Boston Common had a multi-purpose identity through the centuries. Originally as a farm and then trading grounds for the British and American military, the common was used as a camp during the American Revolutionary War. 20 minutes to load these old muskets and a lot of people dying. It was also used for public hangings up until 1817, most of which were from the large oaks, which were eventually all replaced with gallows in 1769. These grounds held weight during the witch trials and made a perfect open concept park that a spectacle could be enjoyed at. These people were sick. This place has seen its fair share of violence. The 350 year old park is full of graves, ghosts, and gallows. It's almost impossible to know just how many bodies lay underneath the park like a cesspool of unmarked graves from many different eras. Most buried here were low class, sick, or died in battle. Oh, and of course were hanged in front of the public. This place is home to many dark shadows, cold spots, and the occasional smell of gunpowder. Next time you're in Boston, swing by one of America's oldest and fullest cemeteries and see if you can see anything for yourself. Number two. The Danvers State Hospital. The Danvers State Hospital, or also known as the Danvers State Insane Asylum, was a psychiatric hospital located in Danvers, Massachusetts. It was built in 1874 and opened in 1878 on the isolated site in rural Massachusetts. Which, fun fact, the judge who preceded the Salem witch trials lived on. That's bad karma already, isn't it? Despite being included in the National Registry for Historical Places in 1984, the majority of the building was demolished in 2007. At a cost of $1.5 million at the time, the hospital originally consisted of two main center buildings with housing for the administration with four radiating wings on each side. The outermost wards were reserved for the most hostile patients. This was a prominent location where medications were being tested by the government and the favored lobotomy was being fleshed out. When shock therapy failed to control the population, lobotomies started and in 1939 the population of the hospital swelled to almost over 2400 patients. A total of 278 people died at the hospital that same year. Neurology experts often call Danvers the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy. Ouch. Visitors to the hospital during these years reported lobotomy patients wandering around staring blankly at nothing, unaware of who they were or what they were doing. Large budget cuts in the 60s played a major role in the progression of closing the Danvers State Hospital, and with nicknames like Hell Hill Hospital and Lunatic Asylum, the hospital began slowly closing its facilities by 1985. The original hospital wards were closed and abandoned soon after. During the 80s, reports began to filter out of the hospital about missing teenage patients. The stories of ghostly figures and shadows in the windows were thriving. Are the ghosts of the lobotomized patients still aimlessly walking the realms of this now demolished hospital? What do you think? And number one, the Bridgewater Triangle. Just a couple miles south of Boston is one of the most interesting and bizarre places in Massachusetts. I chose this as the number one spot due to not only the paranormal ghostly figures that have been seen across the vast plains, but 200 miles of connected weird events. That will definitely catch our attention. It's named from the triangle shape, the paranormal events and phenomenon that occurs within these mapped lines includes as many as orbs, UFOs, Bigfoots, fairies, skinwalkers, alien hybrids, you name it, it's there. Well, possibly there. The towns of Raynham, Brockton, Norton, and Totten are all subject to a universal head scratcher. In the 70s there of course was a surge of UFO witnesses, at the same time several Bigfoot. Huh, that's interesting. Massachusetts just 
keeps getting stranger and stranger, doesn't it? Huge humanoid creatures, motherships, and landed UFOs have also been spotted and reported within this 200 square foot mile radius. Do you think this place is like a Skinwalker Ranch type of place? Maybe some motherships are trying to just reconnect with the Wi-Fi upstairs? I don't know. Whatever it is, the Bridgewater Triangle has been home to numerous documentaries and folklore and attracts spooky goers each year with its variety of paranormal activity. In at number five, we have Whispers Estate. The Whispers Estate was built around 1894, and between 1899 and 1901 is when Dr. George and Sarah White moved in. George was a successful physician and ran his practice from their home. The two adopted many orphaned children, and unfortunately, several passed away in the house over the years. Some of the children they took in were troubled. Many Many of them passed away in the bedrooms and other areas of the home, and even some of Dr. White's patients have been said to have also passed while in the home. Dr. White practiced in the home for over 25 years, so it's probable but unknown how many over the years had passed in the home. In the early 2000s, the home underwent renovations and a lot of bizarre activity began. Many claimed that lights would flicker on and off, footsteps would be heard stomping around on the second floor, and as time went on, the activity escalated. To this day, people reserve time to come and experience all this paranormal activity and are encouraged to write down any experiences they had while in the home. And these accounts are posted to the Whispers Estates official Facebook page. You can go through the page and find creepy photos people have taken that show demonic figures, ghost like creatures and even orbs. It's also pretty common for the guests to be scratched up by unseen fingernails or touched by an unseen hand. The estate earned the Whispers moniker after the numerous guests that experienced somebody whispering in their ear. Somebody they couldn't see. Due to the amount of people who have passed at the home in its early days, it's like there are a number of different spirits that haunt the estate to this day. The Whispers Estate is known as the fourth most haunted house in the United States, but many who have visited believe it to be the most haunted house in the entire country. In at number four, we have Rhodes Hotel. The Rhodes Hotel was established in 1893 and was named after the first owners, Clara and Newton Rhodes. The youngest child in the Rhodes family, Everett, passed in one of the second story bedrooms after contracting tuberculosis at 18 years old. Soon after their daughter's death, Newton unfortunately died and it's believed he had died inside of the house. After Newton's passing, Clara turned the house into a dual brothel and speakeasy. It's said that one of the ladies of the night, Sarah, still haunts her bedroom tucked behind the stairs on the second floor. After Clara's death, the family home was opened as a hotel in the late 1800s and was meant to house those flocking to East Central Indiana during the natural gas boom. It's even believed that John Dillinger and Al Capone stopped at the hotel for a stay after hitching a ride on a train to Indiana. Not only did the family pass in their home, but a preacher by the name of Lester Poor supposedly hanged himself in the attic during the time when the home was converted to a hotel. But many believe his death could have been a murder. Due to the hotel's rich history, many Many locals and visitors have experienced paranormal activity and everyone in the town knew that many spirits that passed in the building still haunt it to this day. The hotel closed its doors in 1937 and the property remained in the Rhodes family hands but sat empty for more than 30 years. The hotel and its contents were eventually auctioned off and it landed on the National Register of Historic Places and the hotel saw three owners before the Haley's took it over for restoration. The Rhodes Hotel was purchased by Clint and Linda Haley in 1995 and they heard rumors about the haunting of the hotel, but this didn't faze them. They were more worried about the work they'd have to do to restore the home. The Haley's claim that they didn't encounter any paranormal activity, but many find that hard to believe. The hotel was up for sale again in 2017 when a man by the name of Couch took it over for his charity. Couch had launched the Lost Limbs Foundation four years earlier, which raised funds for prosthetic limbs for children. To this day, Couch's charity has owned and run the hotel. Not only had it been named among Indiana's most haunted places, but the hotel is consistently booked for private and paranormal investigations. The overnight investigation tickets can get up to $200 and this hotel attracts people from across the country. There have been many investigators that believe there is an extensive activity in this old hotel and people have captured a figure like shadow moving across the living room curtains with the use of night vision cameras. Most commonly people hear whispers in the second floor creaking when no one is inside. Unlike the Haley's, Couch said he's seen and heard supernatural happenings.
happenings in the hotel since moving onto the property in 2017. He has heard footsteps on the staircase, the property camera has turned off randomly and picked up voices before the footage flickers back on. Once while hosting an investigation, Couch said he witnessed one of many Victorian dolls left behind from a previous owner jump off of its chair. In at number 3 we have Avon Bridge. The Avon Bridge is known to be haunted by almost every local living in the area. It is a massive trip art railroad trestle spinning a rural road over White Lick Creek. The bridge is a fascinating landmark in Hendricks County with lots of legends and history surrounding it, some more sinister than others. There are a few historical facts about the bridge that we do know. It was built in 1906 off County Road 625, it was designed by W.M. Dunn and is still used today. Many haunted stories surround this bridge and the area surrounding it. One story claims that a mother had been walking on the tracks and fell to her death. The mother's wailing could be heard when you drive under the bridge. It's common for many locals to honk when driving under the bridge in an effort to muffle her screams. Another story is that a drunk rail worker slipped during construction and was buried alive in the wet cement. The tale is that when a train goes over the bridge, people claim to still hear his moaning. Many locals say that if you go near the bridge at night, you will hear moaning and can see a ghostly figure of a ghost or even two or three at a time. If you're traveling near the bridge on a hot summer day, you may be witness to the ghost tears streaming down the concrete. Many people don't even refer to it as the Avon Bridge. It's often called the Haunted Avon Bridge because of the number of accounts of ghost sightings and constant sounds of the moans and screams heard from the ghosts that haunt the bridge. In at number 2 we have James Allison Mansion. The James Allison Mansion was built for James Allison and it was a dream home, done in a grand design and style that exhibited James's wealth and importance. James was an important figure in the auto and plane industry, greatly helping in the development of cars and airplanes. He founded the Presto Light Company, which produced the first efficient headlight for early automobiles and was a founding partner in Carl Fisher's Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He also started Allison Engineering Company which evolved and transformed formed into an aircraft engine make known today as the Allison Division of Rolls Royce. James purchased the 65 acre estate and he and his wife Sarah built this glorious mansion starting construction in 1911 and finishing in 1913. The massive home had an elevator, a billiard room, an indoor pool in the basement, a breakfast room, a library, a grand kitchen and even pumped in ice water. 15 years after the Allisons built their forever home, James then fell in love with his secretary and he divorced his wife Sarah in 19 1928. Only a month later, James married this former employee, Lucille Musset. However, James contracted a fatal case of pneumonia and died shortly after marrying his second wife at the age of 56. In 1936, the estate went up for sale, and that same year it was bought by Sisters of St. Francis of Oldenburg. The former Allison home became a home for the college's library, administrative offices, classrooms, and sleeping quarters for the sisters. There have been many things seen and heard throughout the years since it became a college. There was a girl who had drowned in the pool in the basement and James's untimely death in the home, both people could be haunting this mansion to this day. It said that people who pass through a sudden accident or a bout of illness, sometimes their spirits hang around, perhaps unaware that they have died or not wanting to accept their deaths. And this is the case for both the little girl and James. The entity of a little girl is often seen throughout the mansion. There are strange cries that are heard from the basement. In the attic, an object seem to move by themselves and can completely disappear. There is another entity seen and could possibly be more than one and they like to take keys and objects and move them to odd places. The library in particular is often completely rearranged like the books and furniture. And finally in at number one we have French Lick Springs Hotel. Nestled in the small resort town of French Lick sits the massive French Lick Springs Hotel. This legendary hotel was constructed in 1845 and is a crown jewel of the southern Indiana town. But there's more to this resort than meets the eye. This Indiana hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in the state. Thomas Taggart was a mayor at the time and purchased the hotel in 1888. After purchasing the hotel, he added luxurious furnishings, marble floors, and built two championship golf courses. During this time, Taggart became the Democratic National Chairman, and the hotel became the unofficial headquarters of the Democratic National Party. In 1931, Franklin Roosevelt visited the hotel because of its Democratic standing and won the presidency a mere year later. Over the years, the hotel hotel and the work Taggart put into it made it one of the most prominent hotels in the area and even ran the West Baden Springs Hotel out of the business. Unfortunately in 1916 Taggart passed away but 
according to local legend, his spirit has never left the building. Taggart died in 1916, but that hasn't stopped rumors of sightings of this famous hotel owner. Guests and employees frequently encounter strange and paranormal activity throughout the hotel, and they believe it is caused by Taggart himself. Many spot his ghostly figure near the service elevator and can pick up a strong scent of pipe tobacco. Others claim they witnessed his spirit riding down the hallway on a horse and making noise inside the ballroom. Some hear noises and others encounter his ghost, though usually both don't occur at the same time. Not only is Taggart's ghost living in the hotel, but there are also rumors of a former bellhop that lingers around the hotel. Many believe that he was a current employee until they saw old photos of him hanging on the wall or were told no bellhops were on duty when people had encountered him. Employees and guests say that it's pretty hard not to encounter some sort of activity when you're in the hotel, and due to the vast amount of paranormal sightings are why it's considered by many to be the most haunted place in Indiana and one of the most haunted places in all of the United States. Coming in at number 5, Silver Bow in Bed and Breakfast. The Silver Bow Bed and Breakfast is located in Juneau, which is the capital city of Alaska. The inn is more famously known for its bakery that was founded in 1898 by the original owner Gus Messerschmidt. This is the oldest bakery in Alaska and some say it is the best. Although people travel from far to taste the treats in the bakers, there are reports of paranormal activity in the inn above. The original owner and founder of the inn reportedly still haunts the premises. The story goes that the owner loved his bakery and inn. He spent his whole life dedicated to creating the finest bakery. From the day it was built, he spent all of his time here. He loved welcoming the customers and ensuring everyone enjoyed their stay. Inevitably, having spent all of his time at the inn, he was here when he passed away in 1938. He was so dedicated in life, it seems his soul was tethered to the place in death. Since he passed away, guests of the bakery and inn have reported a lot of paranormal activity. The most commonly reported sighting is of Gus opening his shop early in the morning. People have seen a figure matching his description walking around the halls as he once did to prepare for his day. This is not the only thing that guests have noticed. Some people have reported knocking on their bathroom door. When they go to investigate who it is, there is no one there, but they have a feeling of being watched. Many believe this is Gus checking up on the guests. He also wanted to ensure everyone staying there was happy. And people believe this is a sign that he's still checking in on the guests today. Coming in at number four, the Hotel Captain Cook. The Hotel Captain Cook, located in Anchorage, is notorious for its paranormal spirit, which has been nicknamed the White Lady. People often take ghost tours of the hotel, hopeful of a chance to meet this famous spirit. Although the origins of the ghost are mostly unknown, from her behavior, it appears she passed away in the women's bathroom, or at least in the area which may have been home to something else before the hotel was built. The locals explain how she is bound to this place and is unable to pass on. She could possibly be cursed as she seems distressed about her situation. Since the hotel opened, there was a lot of paranormal behavior in the area. She would break the glass of the mirrors in the ladies' bathroom or swing open the doors to scare those inside. The hotel management had to step in when one guest used the bathroom stall located at the very end of the ladies' room. While in the stall, she felt something fall around her neck and start to get tighter and tighter. The woman panicked and ran from the stall. As soon as she left the cubicle, the sensation stop. Since then, the bathroom has been bolted shut as to stop this from happening to anyone else. She does seem to be mostly contained to this stall, but there are still paranormal happenings. Lights turn on and off on their own. No one has been hurt since the spirit was locked away, but I would still stay far away from this hotel. Unless you're looking for an angry spirit, this is a hotel that should not be on your list of destinations to visit. Although, my parents were there and it's fine. You know, they're gooch. They're gooch again. Coming in at number 3, we have the Golden North Hotel. The Skagway Golden North Hotel may look like a classic hotel located on the main street, but it has seen tragedy and has the ghost to prove it. People say this place is haunted by a lady who passed away many years ago. She is bound to room 23 on the third floor, but her presence can be felt in the area around the building. The locals tell the story of how this woman became bound to room 23. It's unknown in what year the story takes place, but it was many years ago. The woman was visiting the hotel with her husband. They visited the area so her husband could go on a gold expedition. The expedition was over a number of days to possibly weeks and the wife was to stay at the hotel and explore the local area. The day arrived and the husband left on his expedition, leaving his wife alone. Not long after the husband had left, the woman caught pneumonia. She became sicker and sicker. There was no one in the area able to help her. She had no way to get to a local doctor with no knowledge of the area. She sadly passed away in little over a week due to her illness. When her husband returned, he was heartbroken to find his wife had passed. 
She had been laying in their room for weeks awaiting his return. The locals were shocked to hear what happened and horrified no one had heard her cries and helped her survive her ailment. Since then she has been bound to the room. Other guests have heard sounds coming from the room which remains empty. The spirit can be heard coughing or choking. Some have said they saw her from the window of the hotel when walking around the area late at night. Some have even heard her cries for her husband. When anyone tries to investigate the room they just find it empty and cold. The cold of the room takes over you as soon as you open the door. You can feel you are in the presence of a spirit and are overcome with sadness. Coming in at number 2 we have Independence Mine. The Independence Mine, now known as the Independence Mine State Historic Park, is the site of a former gold mining operation. It is located in Palmer, Alaska. The mining history in the area dates back to at least 1897. The mining town now sits abandoned. The operations were temporarily halted in 1950 with the plan to eventually resume operations. They were never able to resume the operations. This resulted in a well preserved collection of mining equipment and buildings. Although weather has taken its toll, many of the buildings still stand today. As we know with many mines there are often accidents due to the dangerous nature of the work. Parts of the mine would often collapse. The mine is now a big tourist site as a look into the life and work of miners in 1897. The visitors have reported a lot of paranormal activity while touring the facility. Almost everyone who visits the mine sees some form of activity there. There are many apparitions that appear. They walk around the mine as if they were doing their usual days work. Some have even seen cigar smoke coming from certain locations. You can smell and see the smoke but there are no cigars in the area that could be making the smoke. Tour guides have noted that they often have the feeling of being followed. They can feel themselves being watched each time they tour the facility. Some have even found footprints that don't belong to them or any one in their group. Although there is a lot of paranormal activity in the area, tourists still come to see the remains of the mining town. The ghosts seem to be well intended. They may merely be echoes through time of the souls who passed here. As far as we know, there have not been any visitors who have been hurt during their visit. I would still be wary of visiting here though. Finally, in at number one, we have At the White House. At the White House was built in 1902 and is now on the National Historic Register due to how long it has been standing in the community. It has had many issues since. It was built. It was originally built as a hospital, then it was used as a daycare center, and today it is used as a hotel. Any building that was used as a historic hospital has seen a lot of tragic passings. When the building was used as a daycare center, there was a tragic fire. The building caught fire in the 1980s. It was fully restored following this. During the fire, the young woman who owned and ran the daycare was trapped inside. After ensuring all of the children were safe, she became trapped and unfortunately perished. Since the fire, her apparition has appeared around the home. Most guests believe her to be a kind spirit but she does bring on the feeling of dread and terror when she is in your presence. Guests at the hotel have claimed to be startled awake by the young woman standing at the foot of the bed. Once they wake up and become frightened the spirit usually disappears. Workers at the hotel claim that she appears to show more interest in families with children. She reportedly had a love for looking after children and even in death she wanted to ensure their safety during their stay at the hotel. It is unknown what room she was trapped in during the tragic fire but there are numerous cold spots around the hotel. Others have heard faint screams and cries coming from certain rooms. She is hailed as a hero for saving all of the children during the fire, but guests are still frightened when greeted by her ghosts in the early hours of the morning. Kicking off the list at number five, the Landmark Inn. Located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right around Lake Superior, you'll find the Landmark Inn. Yeah, nice and cute and cozy. Come on in, take your coat off, stay a while. This fancy hotel was originally built in 1930 as a luxury accommodation for wealthy business owners from all around the United States. Sounds like a good time. Let's gather, let's talk, let's talk shop around candles. These business owners would visit the landmark to check on their business interests, all that good stuff. Though for its 100 years being open to guests, the hotel has had multiple reports of, you guessed it, ghosts and paranormal activity. It's so common at the Landmark Inn that the ghost hunters and paranormal investigators, they make trips out to the hotel quite often just to check in and be like, hey, how's it going? And they put on their gadgets and they just check in on them. They can rely on them. The hotel's sixth floor is home to one of the saddest stories the hotel has ever seen. This story takes place in the 1930s when the hotel was a new lively social and cultural center in town. The story revolves around a ship worker who fell in love with a local librarian and conducted their love affair in the lilac room. Yeah, of all places, of course. Let's go meet the lilac room. Sounds beautiful. And that was where the man was staying. Perfect place to meet. The couple was said to have a planned wedding upon his return from the last voyage on the sometimes treacherous Lake Superior. Unfortunately, their love affair ended in tragedy when his ship met with a storm and sank to the bottom of a lake. He never returned to the shore and the librarian mourned the man in said lilac room, eventually dying herself of a broken heart. The heartbreaking story comes with many reports of the lilac room now being haunted. 
Yeah, rightfully so. As a large number of guests has reported hearing cries and whispers from a female. The female is also seen by many guests and workers on the sixth floor near the lilac room, crying and mourning for her loved one. A less romantic story that is associated with the hotel goes back to when it was even finished being built. During construction, a man ended the life of his girlfriend due to anger and jealousy. And this took place right after she told them about her past boyfriends and their relationship history. Just normal stuff that he flipped out on, just a monster. And since the hotel was still being built, to conceal the evidence, the man buried her in the unfinished basement. Just horrible stuff. You knew I was going there and you're like, ah, oh, please don't. To this day, decades later, visitors and employees report hearing cries from that basement and some report hearing whispers from a female voice asking for them to find her body. I just got goosebumps. That's real goosebumps. No matter how much time goes by, these two women, heartbroken for different reasons, still haunt said hotel today. Number four, Michigan Bell Telephone Building. The Bell Telephone Building can be found in downtown Grand Rapids. It's known from the legend that the building is haunted by two ghosts. It's always two, eh? I always gotta have pairs. Good things come in pairs, even demons. These spirits have consistently caused chaos throughout the buildings for years in their own unique personal way. We love it, we love a unique ghost. The spirits that haunt the Bell Building are rumored to be Warren and Virginia Randall, a couple who used to reside in the Grand Rapids. Back in 1907, they moved from Detroit and bought the Judd White Mansion in Grand Rapids, which has now been torn down and built into what we now know as the Bell Telephone Building. So a lot of history there already. Over the years of living in this new house, Warren and Virginia's relationship started to crumble as Warren became very strange and paranoid almost, creating hardships in their relationship. In 1908, Virginia became tired of Warren's strange and aggressive behavior, so she decided, I'm out of here, peace. She left him. One night, three years after they were separated, Warren convinced Virginia and had taken a car ride with them, you know, hoping to get back together, maybe talk it out. The two of them ended up at the Judd White House where their verbal disagreement turned horrible and Warren sadly took the life of Virginia. Then he proceeded to end his own life in the very same moment. The tragic accident that happened in the Judd White House became public knowledge and the house was left empty with no one wanting to occupy it. Yeah, more than fair. I'm like, what's rent? Also, what happened? No. The house remained abandoned for 10 years after the accident Accident until they finally just decided to tear the thing down completely. Thus, in 1924, they built the Bell Telephone Building on the ground, which still is in operation today. Yeah, they didn't tear that one down. That one's still going strong. Due to the horrifying scenes that happened on the grounds of the Bell Building, many claims that the spirits of Randall and Virginia still remain, haunting the new building. Some say the ghosts move into the new building and remain there to this day. I mean, I think that's possible. Ghosts like to move. They like to they can go through walls, they can probably relocate. Through the years of operation in the office building, visitors and employees all report being harassed by strange late night calls, which have been traced back to be coming from inside of the building itself. Yeah, inside the house, you guessed it, it's upstairs, that's so scary. Due to this and the strange eerie feelings that the employees feel while they're even working, it's safe to say Randall and Virginia may remain on the grounds, most likely, they're, they're definitely there. It sounds like they're there, they're for sure there. Number three, the Henderson Castle. Established in 1895, this castle is a hub for many spirits in paranormal activity. I mean, it's a castle. The original owners, Frank and Mary Henderson, are said to haunt the castle as they passed away back in 1899. Yeah, I wouldn't want to leave either, living or dead. Additionally, other spirits are said to reside in the castle, a young girl and a dog. Yeah, a dog, we've got a dog ghost. How do you deal with that? Ghost barks? That'd be so scary. In 2005, the castle was occupied by Peter Livingstone McNellis and his family. When the family resided in the castle, Livingstone's son, Vincent, before anyone else had ever reported anything strange happening in the house, he said that he saw an apparition of a figure in the Victorian room. Originally, the changing room for one Mary Henderson. The son said while pointing at a picture of a woman dressed in an old period clothing, some Victorian clothing, that that was the woman he saw wearing that same clothing. I would throw up. If someone ever said that, I'd be like, oh, this Victorian painting? And one former innkeeper who stayed at the castle each night told Livingstone on numerous occasions that she also felt a presence coming up and down the staircase. A movement passing her on the stairs when she would walk by. Ugh, these are scary. Top five is like, you know, or top 10 is scary fish. This is, this is hard. This is some scary stuff. 9 a.m. I'm already getting spooked. While now the castle is being used for a bed and breakfast, guests have fallen victim to ghosts as well. Yeah, it's not over yet. The Henderson Castle is a very paranormal active ground that many ghost hunters have investigated and they've confirmed, in fact, that it's haunted by spirits. I trust them. The people that can go into these castles and physically do this, I'm like, yep, I trust your opinion, whatever. He just comes out, he's like, haunted. We're like, thanks, Daryl. This has been confirmed as these ghosts have interacted with many paranormal investigator teams in addition to guests and employees of the castle. Yeah, there's her and everyone. The ghosts seem to be friendly, not evil whatsoever, so that's a good side, I guess, to being 
uh, haunted by ghosts. They have been known to speak and physically touch guests and employees. Just they touch them on their back, side, shoulder, always in the back. You never see it coming. It's always in always in this region. Not only that, but there's also been reports of radios making weird noises or turning on by themselves, even though they're either unplugged or just either turned off. Both bad, both scary. Guests and employees have also reported hearing footsteps upstairs, slamming doors from unexplainable sources, and some ghosts have been wearing the clothes that they wore while they were alive. Clothes that they wore while they died in, probably. As the spirit of Mary Henderson has been reported as many guests at the top of the staircase, wearing her usual getup. Imagine being like a clown, like a jester, and then you die in that, and that's what you look like as a ghost. You're like, what? I was doing a mascot gig. I don't look like a shark forever. Number two, Elegant Hodge. The old Elegant Elk Lodge was built in 1909. It was used as a psychiatric and TB hospital until its closure in 1948. The lodge was a former hospital that was frequented by mobster Al Capone and one that many say is haunted by at least seven different ghosts. Yeah, you thought, you thought two was bad. Add five more, now we got seven ghosts. And it's currently on the auction block in Allegan. If you have a lot of money and bravery, there you go. While the structure was originally built by physician John Robinson in 1909, somewhere in the 1920s, it was sold to a doctor from the Chicago area who had allegedly had underworld ties. That's a great doctor. You got just who you want working on your pancreas. Brought pancreas back today. The facility was supposedly frequented by mafia figures such as Al Capone, the Prohibition era Chicago mob boss, and his men. Yeah, when they needed medical attention or when they simply needed to get away from Chicago, this is where they'd go. The, the old Elks Lodge, Al Capone. He's like, oh, it's cozy. They have great soup. <laughs> Years later, it was used as an Eagles Lodge and an Elks Lodge. And in 2010, it was acquired by an elegant woman who began renovating the property, but now she wants to sell it. Yeah, can't imagine why. Because one of the former doctors who owns the lodge had underworld ties, maybe? Something like that? I don't know. It led to a lot of people believing that there's a lot of undercover stuff about this lodge. It's still happening to this day. I don't know why I'm doing this, like it's like over there, but I'm like, there's something going on in that lodge. Especially as it's known to hold seven different paranormal entities, like I mentioned previously. For many years, employees and visitors have told stories of spirits who relentlessly roam the building. Some of the paranormal activity that has been experienced here includes cabinets opening up by themselves in the kitchen, sounds of children laughing, it's always calming in the morning, photographic anomalies captured throughout the building, and like you name it, shadowy figures in the basement, all bad. Notably where the morgue was located, the basement, good stuff, a lot of a lot of stuff happening in there. They'd be knocking on the front door, indiscernible conversations, and ringing at the doorbell when no one was present. Yeah, good stuff. Again, I have, uh, I have goosebumps, they're back. Guests also heard footsteps and the sound of hospital activity long after being used as one. They'd also see full-bodied apparitions of, uh, of children. They would just see ghost children. That would be it. I wouldn't have to see any more. I would just see the ghost children and be like, Again, see ya. Like that's. And finally, number one, point oh, Barks Lighthouse. There are plenty of lighthouses in Michigan, and plenty of them are rumored to be haunted, of course, because they're lighthouses and they're creepy, as they normally are. And this one is no exception. Built in 1847, real old, real, a lot of history with this one. The lighthouse is located on point oh, Barks. As the legend goes, early to mid 1800s, Peter Shook had been point oh, Barks' first lighthouse keeper. He was the OG. In 1849, Peter drowned while he and a couple of friends were sailing to Port Huron to pick up supplies for the lighthouse. He left behind eight kids and his wife, Catherine, and she took over at that point for Peter's duties, thus becoming Michigan's first female lighthouse keeper. Since then, people have claimed to see the spirit of Catherine walking along the edge of a cliff dressed in mourning clothes as she is still heartbroken by the loss of her lover, of course. As we talked about earlier, ghosts like to wear the things that they were, you know, that they passed away in. Again, would hate to be a clown outfit. That would suck. She had also been spotted in the window of the second floor wearing an apron, along with an apparition being seen, footsteps ascending and descending, the tower stairs, and giggling has also been Heard. Yeah, you hear giggling and there's cold spots, therefore haunted, for sure haunted. And the smell of burnt tobacco has also been whopping through the air many a times. Lighthouses are pretty stressful, more than fair. My paranormal investigators, specifically the Southeast Michigan Paranormal Society team, when they had a two day intensive investigation after their search, they concluded that they believe that there's every reason for the lighthouse to be haunted. The investigators did some electric voice phenomenon work in the living room and then they heard loud thuds from overheard. Like where do they get this gear from, you know? Like I, I want this gear, I have some questions in my Myself going on in the apartment. I want to swing it around a bit. A sound of something scraping along the floor as well and additionally during their investigation the rocking chair had moved two feet and was still moving. Just love to keep rocking around. We love that. We love haunted rocking chairs. We love unexplainable forces. While they were upstairs they also reported hearing heavy footsteps from another unknown source. So many ghosts, there's rocking chairs, people moving around, working in the basement. It doesn't sound like the afterlife is a peaceful one if I'm being honest. Sounds like there's a lot of to do after you die. I'm not really looking forward to it. I thought I could just kind of float around in your paintings, but now it sounds like I'm gonna have to go and wear this. Wear my morning clothes, who knows?